May the Lord be with you. Let us take a moment to center ourselves on God. If you would please stand and join me in the call to worship as it is printed in the bulletin. I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. I will, God's I will meditate on God's good works. The Lord's way is full of God is the wonder worker. God is here among us. Let us pray. O oh God, light of the minds that know you, life of the souls that love you, strength of the thoughts that seek you, help us so to know you that we may truly love you, so to love you that we may fully serve you, whose service is perfect freedom through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Please be seated. Friends in Jesus Christ, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sins to our loving God, first together, then afterwards, individually, in silence. Let us join in the, in the prayer that is printed in the bulletin today. God, in the light of your goodness, we see that we have not been grateful people. We often harbor jealously and covet what our neighbors possess. We look at what we don't have rather than at our abundance. We are slow to offer you our thanks. Heal us of bitterness or resentment. Bathe us in your mercy and feed us with your grace so that we may follow your way and live the good news of the gospel. Amen. <clears throat> now let us spend a few moments in silent prayer and meditation, bringing to God our individual thoughts and confessions. Amen. And this is love, not that we love God. Gave his son as the means of our forgiveness. Friends, know that you and I are forgiven in Jesus Christ and be at peace. Amen. the peace of Jesus Christ be with you. Please share this peace with one, with one another. Welcome home, children of God. It is a joy to be here with you all today as your pastors are vacationing. Thank you for having me and allowing me to serve with Roger today. I would like to also welcome all of our guests and visitors. It is a joy to have you as well. And for those of you who are able to come back, we pray that you will. And we hope that today's worship is fulfilling and meaningful in your life. I would like to take a moment to draw your attention to the golden insert in your bulletin with our announcements and our prayer re requests. We ask that you keep the folks on the prayer request list in your thoughts and prayers this week and the weeks ahead. Take some time too, if you don't mind, to sign the attendance registers and pass those down the aisle and make sure everyone is greeted and gets a chance to sign them. I do have one additional announcement that I would like to call your attention to, and that is to remind you that the fellowship hall will be closed to all foot traffic this week, Monday through Friday, and that is for all of us. 
Uh, I guess we can invite the children down now for the children's moment, and they will be able to receive their busy bags as well. We'll wait for you because we just have a couple, so we'll wait. Good morning. How are you this morning? Oh, yeah. You can go in. You can be okay. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that's much better. Uh, this morning, how many of you have been absent from school and had to take an excuse? You have to take an excuse when you're sick, when you're at school. Well, this morning I want to talk to you a little bit about excuses because sometimes those excuses are pretty silly. Well, and I don't want to ask you all, is that I'm in high school first grade now? Uh, are you in first grade now? Oh, no, good. I just have class. Oh, okay. Well, we're still going to talk just a little bit. And I'm going to read you some excuses that some of the children took to school at some time because they're kind of silly. One says, please excuse Josh for being absent. I forgot to wake him up. I did not find him until I started making the beds. My, by then it was too late for him to go to school. That's what his mom said. And then the next one was, Josh didn't come to school today because he wasn't feeling, because he was feeling, thought he was going to be sick. But he wasn't sick. That was another silly one. One more. Please excuse Janet's absence from school. It was take your daughter to work. Well, I don't work. And so I kept her home and let her do housework. And I'm going to tell you one more excuse, and then we're going to talk about excuses that some people gave to Jesus when he was walking on the earth. But one more excuse was when I was little, and I was going to be late for school, and my mother owned a bakery. And so she gave me six cupcakes, and on each cupcake it said, please excuse Judy, for being late. And you know what? The people in the office really liked those, that excuse. In fact, I think they ate them. Now, um, in Jesus' time, there, there were some excuses, and you're going to hear some excuses this morning. And they were walking along, and Jesus asked, was at, walking along the road with a group of people. And Drew, Jesus turned to one of them and said, follow me. And you know what? That man gave him an excuse. He said, okay, I will, but let me go first and bury my father. Well, the next man he met, he said to the next person, he said, come and follow me. And that one said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back home and tell everybody goodbye. Now, what Jesus was trying to say was, you don't need to have an excuse to follow me. And even today, every single one of us, we don't need an excuse. Jesus just says, follow me. I had an instructor in college one time that said to our class, do not give me an excuse because no excuse is accepted. If you're late, don't give it to me. I don't care what it is. And that's what Jesus is saying. Don't give, us an ex give him an excuse. Jesus just says, follow me no matter what you're doing. Still follow me. Let's bow our heads for a prayer. Our Father, when Jesus calls us to follow him, may we never offer excuses. Instead, may we be willing to give up everything and follow you. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and all God's children say, Amen. Thank you. You don't need money? Okay. Lots of children this morning. That's good. Good sign. Thank you, Judy, for that children's moment. There, she said amen.
Let us bow together in prayer as we prepare to listen to God's word. Prepare our hearts, O God, to access your eternal word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may obey your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. First reading is from the Old Testament, as you can see, page 308 in your pew Bible. And this is a story about two of the great prophets of the Old Testament, Elijah and Elisha. You may remember this story as we read it this morning. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they were both standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, all of a sudden a chariot of fire and horses of the separated, separated the two, and Elijah ascended into a whirlwind into heaven whirlwind. All of a sudden he went up and disappeared. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. <coughs> He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he had struck the water, the water was parted to one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. The word of the Lord. New Testament lesson is taken from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 9, verses 51 through 62. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered the village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another one he said, Follow me. But the man said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. 
Another one said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Peace to you, Christ. I would like to ask you, what is the Spirit doing in your life these days? How about in the life of this congregation? Now, I know that asking a group of Presbyterians about the Holy Spirit is probably the quickest way to ensure a lull in the conversation, but I do genuinely want to know. What is the Spirit doing in your life these days? Shared vision and a real buy-in to that vision. Having goals and clear ways of achieving those goals is healthy for organizations and for individuals to thrive. Being able to articulate your own mission, your vision, where you are headed in life, your goals and those steps to achieving those goals oftentimes requires a measure of courage. And also, revisiting our vision from time to time is important, as the solutions we make to problems that we had 10 years ago are not the same solutions that we need today in order to thrive. And while I may not know you all individually, I can share with you that I have witnessed firsthand the mission statement of your church over these first few weeks of my internship. You have welcomed me with Christ's all-encompassing hospitality. I have seen that mission statement come to life in the work of your pastor and his attentiveness to my learning. I have seen it in the care shown by my host, Carol, and her openness and warmth. I have commissioned your youth to do mission work. I have worked alongside your staff, visited shut-ins, offered communion, eaten delicious meals over in the fellowship hall after worship. I've been invited to dinners and coffee and lunches and even a birthday party with a real live unicorn. Oh, mermaid. <laughs> I have been well-loved and well-received, and you have been hospitable to me. You have been hospitable to me, and I myself share your mission. I myself came to you and was wholeheartedly accepted and accept your mission to which you have been called. I, too, wish to embody Jesus's all-encompassing hospitality. Together, our faces are set towards this goal, and we are on the way to achieving it. What can be challenging for us as groups and as individuals is how we react when we come up against people who just aren't getting on board with us. When someone or a group of someones doesn't want to walk alongside us in our journey, what do we do when someone's mission statement, their vision, their thoughts and ideas aren't the same as ours? In our gospel reading from today, Luke writes that Jesus had his face set on Jerusalem. And to say that his face was set tells us that he was determined he was steadfast and he was moving towards his goal. His ministry in Galilee, his teaching and healing there had run its course. It was time to set out on a new journey. And the text points out that he sent messengers ahead of him on this journey. Jesus was not alone in this mission. He was working alongside individuals 
who shared his vision, they were committed to a like cause. When Jesus entered Samaria in his travels from Galilee to Jerusalem, as Samaria was on the way, the text tells us that the Samaritans did not receive him because his face was set to Jerusalem. Many times in the Gospels we read of Jesus dealing favorably with the Samaritans despite their sordid history and cultural differences, but here Luke is very point blank to say that the Samaritans did not receive Jesus. They turned him away because of his purpose, because of his clear and determined mission. The Samaritans knew well of the Jewish tradition that put Jesus on the path that day. They themselves were relatives of the once unified Israelite kingdom, but on this day, there was no room for Jesus or his disciples in their village. I can imagine how that must have felt to be told that you do not belong here. We don't agree with what you have set out to do, so there is not a place here for you. We don't agree with your calls, so move on. Go somewhere else to rest. Get out of our town. It's sad to think about, really. And the disciples' reaction isn't surprising when they ask Jesus if fire should come down from heaven and consume the Samaritans for dissing them like that. How often do we react in this way when people don't see things our way? Take five minutes on social media to see how completely a human a response it is to feel, to need, to feel the need to attack when we are judged. When we are judged by our neighbors, when the people we have a shared history with do not affirm our passions, or when we receive dismissing remarks and actions from our own relatives and family, it hurts. And we often throw up defenses, or worse, attack them right back. Last summer, I completed my clinical pastoral education at a group of hospitals in my hometown of Columbia, South Carolina. For 10 weeks, I worked as a hospital chaplain I visited patients at their bedside and prayed with grieving families, provided pastoral presence and prayer in the emergency room trauma bays. I helped families fill out bereavement forms while praying over their past loved ones. And in all of this really heavy and really important work, we had a parallel track of learning in this experience. And it was deeply personal an interpersonal small group time to reflect on our past experiences and see how those wounds and hurts express themselves in our ministry. This work required vulnerability. And I had a nice group to do this with. There was five of us in total, four seminary students from different denominations, and I got along with them very well. And there was one former Baptist preacher who was seeking a career change and thinking of working as a full-time chaplain. As the days and weeks passed, I could feel myself growing close to my group mates, all but the former Baptist minister. I'm sure my supervisor could tell this too, and it was her job to gently and aggressively push us to uncover our shadow sides in these daily small group meetings. What I found painfully and eventually was that out of my fear of being rejected by him as a single female seeking to do ministry, I was cutting him off before he could reject me. Wasn't even giving him a chance to accept me for who I am and what God has called me to do. In that moment, he was not invited into my world. I was telling him, in other words, I know that you do not agree with me. Now go. Brothers and sisters, what happens when we react out of fear, defensiveness, or judgment 
is that we create the very same barriers that we are seeking to dismantle. We are participating in the same actions that seek to limit God's grace, which is extended to all people. Jesus responds to the disciples' anger and their fear and their frustration by offering these words in verse 56, which are found in some ancient manuscripts of this text. The Son of Man has not come to destroy the lives of human beings, but to save them. And after he spoke this, they went on their way to another village. They remained committed to their path, and they continued on their mission despite being rejected, without looking back, and without harming their neighbors. And as they were walking, I am sure they were shook with what happened in Samaria. They were feeling all those feels of rejection. One of the disciples says to Jesus, Oh, I will follow you wherever you go. And we too are real quick to see from a distance this exchange between the Samaritans and Jesus and say, oh, but Jesus, I wouldn't turn you away. No, I would never do that. But Jesus responds to the disciples then, and he responds to us as Jesus' followers today, as he reminds us to evaluate our commitment to the commission and mission of the gospel. Like the disciples, we too are called to follow Jesus without making excuses and without looking back. We too are on the way with our faces set. We live and move in an already and not yet kingdom, working as the hands and feet of Christ in the world today on this day, extending God's love and Christ's hospitality and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit coming together at one table to be reminded of our shared mission and ministry. So friends, I ask you, what is the Spirit doing in your life? What attachments, what fears, what hurts, what frustrations are keeping us from freely and fully following Jesus today? as we follow Jesus, we are called to lead others to follow Jesus as well. Not everyone will understand, but with our faces set, surely we are on the way. Let us pray. Gracious God, affirm within us any right word that has been spoken and received. Pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
remain standing in body or in spirit as we affirm together our belief through this excerpt from the Scots Confession that is printed in your bulletin. Christians, what do you believe? We confess and acknowledge one God alone, to whom alone we must believe, whom alone we must serve, whom only we must worship, and in whom alone we put our trust, who is eternal, infinite, immeasurable, incomprehensible, omnipotent, invisible, one in substance, yet thinking. Please be seated. We turn now to God in prayer as we pray the prayers of the people. I will ask you to remember the names on that prayer request list, please, and all of those that are in your heart that have not been named. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray for those locked in circumstances beyond their control, restrained by oppressors and seeing no end to their captivity. May they discover hope buried in deepest suffering through Jesus Christ, who shared the weakness and despair of human life, yet gave even death a new outcome and brought resurrection from a closed tomb. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church set in the world to show how people belong together and how your gifts are given to be shared. Grant that as we feel for the rejection and voicelessness of others, we may meet Christ in them and bear witness to this transforming love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the communities in which we live and work, for people under stress and unable to deal with their difficulties, for those who seek comfort in ways which bring no help, for all who are fearful. Give us grace to show by our concern and actions how each is loved and valued by you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember now those who are hidden from us but at home with you. We give thanks especially for those who have strengthened our weak faith built up our trust in you, and by their lives have drawn us into the life of Christ, who died in weakness and reigns in glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. And now will you join with me as we pray together the prayer our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art. Before we receive our offering, I just want to say a few words. I'm, I'm certainly <clears throat> glad that Hunter Camp is coming back from his vacation tomorrow. It's <laughs> been a very busy week in many respects. Many pastoral needs. In fact, I made five visits to the hospital in these two weeks. Had several critical phone calls to people who were very, very ill. All kinds of situations arose. And Hunter Camp and Amy Camp deal with these kinds of things every day. 
Well, I've come to a new, a new appreciation of our pastor and his wife. They certainly do a wonderful ministry. Do you agree? If so, just applaud. That's right. And we certainly hope they've had a very relaxing and wonderful vacation. <laughs> Let us now prepare as we, to receive the offering. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. With gladness, let us give generously of our life and work to the Lord. Will the ushers please come forward?
Please remain standing. Let us join in this responsive prayer of thanksgiving, which is printed in your bulletin. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God, who encounters us in everyday life, thank you for your mysterious presence. Thank you for your love and mercy. Thank you for our church community that strives to embody Jesus' all-encompassing hospitality. Thank you for the possibilities of new life that you offer us. Holy God, please accept the offerings of ourselves and our money and that we may work and serve Jesus Christ, who came to make all things new. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>